very well known and familiar scripture, at least it should be to all of us, that old, old story. Comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Please follow along as I read. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, and to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. <coughs> Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. The title of my message tonight is The Greatest Historical Event. And the one idea is that when God incarnated, it is the most important thing. It is the most important thing to all of us that God, the creator of the universe, as vast and great as it is, and as old and mysterious as it is, the creator who called all matter and time and space into existence, incarnated and entered humanity as a little baby. And I believe with all my heart that that is a fact of history and it is the truest fact that there ever was. And because it's true, it is the most important thing to every human being that has ever lived and ever will live. Because he is our only hope for eternal life, for the forgiveness of sin, and having any chance of having a relationship with God Almighty. He is our only hope. And there is not a thing you and I can do on our own to make ourselves right with God or to even to establish a relationship with Him. And that was all done by His incarnation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And how did God enter the world? How did Jesus come into being? How did He come in to humanity? Well, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Now, that's Octavius. Caesar, 
It is a title, and it means king. The German form of Caesar is Kaiser. Remember in your history, Kaiser Wilhelm, <laughs> all of that? Caesar. <coughs> Augustus is a, also a title, and it means anointed one. In other words, they elevated. He was the first Roman emperor. The Roman Republic had died. Augustus made sure of that. <laughs> uh, and he came to power, but his proper name was his full name would be Caesar Octavius Augustus. And he was very good at what he did. He was a great ruler. He was a great administrator. And he was a great accountant. And he wanted to know how many people, he wanted to know <laughs> how many taxpayers he had. <laughs> Just like our government today, they seem to be obsessed with knowing how many taxpayers we have. And how much do they think they can, you know, get away with taking from us, you know? And that's exactly how Augustus thought, and he was very good at it. And he put out a census so that all the world could be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all that went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Now that was a procedure, a system that started off in Egypt and was spread out apart that whole part of the world that you had to register for taxation in the city that you were born in. Now, what advantage did that have? Well, it's easier to lie about your identity <laughs> when you're in a foreign town, right? When you're not from, you know, when you're not from here, you can kind of make up your own past. But that's harder to do if you were, say, born, let's say if you're born into Ferret, it's hard to tell a false story about your origins if everybody knows you. Isn't that correct? So that was the reason why David, uh, the city of David, uh, all the people that were born in that city in Bethlehem had to return there. Now Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth at the time. And it was a backwater little town uh, <clears throat> up in north near the community of Capernaum, near that community on the, in Galilee, the province of Galilee. And the government, it took a little while between the time Caesar made the decree and it was actually executed. It could have been as later as two or four years from the time that Caesar made the decree to the time they actually were able to set up a system where people could actually take the census, not to collect the taxes so much, but that there was a tax, and the tax was a poll tax, it was one denarius a year, one denarii uh, a year, and the Jewish people hated that tax. Boy, how many in here hate taxes? No, I hate taxes. <laughs> well, I think the property tax, oh man, this, this state is losing people because the taxes are so high. And boy, but the Jews couldn't leave their hometowns. They, that's where God gave them that land. <laughs> God gave them that land. And they weren't about to be ruled by anybody but God, much less Caesar and any of his Roman. And the Roman army was occupying Israel at the time, occupying Judea, and they were hated. They were occupying. No one, the Jews believed, no one has a right to rule over us but God alone. And boy, they resented. And you know where those taxes went? It paid for the military that was occupying them. And that, and that made it, it was insult to injury, and it showed that they had to pay that tax. They felt like they were slaves to the Romans. And by and large, they were having to pay that tax. And they resented it. And everyone had to go to his own city. So it's about 80 miles, depending on the route you took. Uh, depending on the route, if you took the smooth, easy route, it was about 100 miles. If you took the medium path, it was about 80. And if you took the roughest, most direct path over the mountains, which had been tough on donkey and foot and with a pregnant lady, uh, woman, that had been about 70 miles, depending on how you went. But they, off they went to be taxed. And they, how did they go? David's hometown was Bethlehem. Because in Micah, the prophet Micah, 5, 2, 500 years before this event, predicted 
that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And that prophecy, and you know, God used Caesar to fulfill his will. We don't know if well, it's very probable that Mary and Joseph knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But God made it happen. He used Caesar to do it. He made the decree years before. And now it's happening. They're on their way to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. And Mary didn't have to go on that trip. She didn't have to go. But she chose to go. One reason is probably that Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. The second reason, she didn't want to be away from Joseph because what did Joseph do for her? He protected her. He protected her from the rumors and the slander and the fear that any moment a mob could be incited and Mary would be stoned to death. You know, Mary uh, was pregnant before she was married. She was away from Bethlehem when she returned expecting after a visit. We don't know, at least it was discovered then, on her return trip from visit with Elizabeth. And she was in a bad shape. She was pregnant, a teenager, and unmarried. Today, Satan could have killed that baby easy. Planned Parenthood and all of that, he could have done it easy. And he tried. Remember, we'll get to that a little later, when the infants were slaughtered in Bethlehem, when the Magi deceived Herod the Great. And she's pregnant, she's in a bad shape, she's in a desperate, a desperate situation. But she trusted God. The angel Gabriel came to her and told her, you're going to have a son. And he's going to save the people from their sins. And you're going to call him, what? Jesus. And even God named that baby before he was even born. And while she was there, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, swaddling clothes or swaddling a baby is still practiced in many places in the Middle East today. And they'll take just strips of cloth and just wrap a baby's arms together down and wrap them from the top to bottom. They thought that the warmth of that wrapping would do a few things. One, it would protect the baby's internal organs by keeping them warm. Uh, the confined space, comfort the baby by being in a confined space. And it was also keep the baby from reaching up and scratching himself. That was a, another reason. And... If a baby was not swaddled, uh, it was considered neglect. And they wanted to make sure they were poor. Where were they staying? You know, we have these nativity scenes where we see this structure, this wooden structure, thinking that, you know, that's a manger. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it was most likely a cave. This, that's a nice thing, not putting that down, but it's most likely a cave that was hollowed out in that place, and inside was a little food crate, a little, just a, a little box where they put food, if cattle feed in it, and so probably Mary and Joseph put some hay down in there, and that's where they laid, and that was Jesus' crib, and it was a smelly, stinky cow pen, <laughs> or sheep pen. What's that? Absolutely is better than nothing. Uh, but let me tell you, someone living in those conditions were the poorest of the poor. They were the lowest of the low. Jesus, I think we'll all agree with me that our Savior, when he was born, had a very humble beginning, did he not? He, went, he was the king of the universe. He created the rock. That, that manger said it. He created the earth that they were all put in. He was there. He did all of that. But yet here is a weak baby, to, totally dependent on Mary and Joseph for his aid and his protection. Of course, who knows what unseen forces were protecting that baby during his childhood to adulthood. Who knows? We'll never know. But we know that he was divinely protected 
and he was provided for, but he, did, he didn't leave, live a luxurious life. He certainly didn't live the life of a Roman prince, and he was there and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. And so many people today have no room in their lives for Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of reasons for that. People don't want to be accountable to God today. They don't want to be accountable to their parents. They don't want to be accountable to their government. They don't want to be accountable to their school. They think living for someone else is too restrictive even though that someone else is God Almighty. And if you think living for Jesus is tough, try living in rebellion against him. See how better you fare. It's a difficult thing. Is there room in your heart tonight for Jesus? Do you really believe that this young baby was God incarnate? Yes or no? If you say no, I understand. You have every reasonable right to think that and to believe that, and you know what? Until you're convinced different, I'll respect it. But if you know deep down inside of you that that answer to that question is yes, Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, how's it going for you? How's it going for you? Do you need to make him the Lord of your life and your Savior. Jesus said, My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Only one person has ever successfully lived the Christian life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There have been times in my life where I've tried to live the Christian life in my own way, in my own power, and it was the most frustrating time of my life. It wasn't until I said, Okay, Jesus, I'm just going to be still, and I'm going to wait and let you direct my path. And if you open the door, I remember I was 14 years old when I prayed. that. This was after I became a Christian. I was 14, 15, 16, somewhere around there. And I remember the night I prayed, Lord, I'm tired of trying to live the Christian life in my own way, in my own power. It's frustrating. I can't do it. And this is what I said to God. I said, God, you open the door, I'll go through it. But you're going to have to open the door. Best decision I ever made in my life. The best act of faith I ever made in my life. Because you know what God did? He opened those doors. And made the decisions of my life a whole lot more plainer than had I been trying to guess what to do next on my own. There was no room for him in the end. It seemed hopeless. It seemed like there was nothing to do. But you know, God made a way for him, did he not? Amen. Now the scene changes. A whole different subject in verse 8. There was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. Now let me tell you about shepherds. Shepherds were looked down on by the Jewish people, the Hebrew people of the day. They were seen as lowlifes not to be trusty, dirty, nasty. They were not allowed to worship God because they were considered an unclean profession. And, you know, that was kind of a funny thing, that the Jewish priests and the leadership and the Pharisees considered shepherds. But in Psalm 23, what did David say about God? The Lord is what? My shepherd. God's a shepherd. You know, it's amazing how the things that God identifies with and the things that God does, we look down on them. And we think, oh, that's old-fashioned. That morality, oh, it's old-fashioned. Oh, those scripture, that's old-fashioned. Oh, that parable, that's old-fashioned. It's outdated. It doesn't apply today. Have you got anything better? How's that Marxism working out for you? How's that socialism working out for you? How's that humanism working out for you? How's that sexual deviancy working out for you? You're not going to be able to come up with anything better than what God's got planned for you. And 
lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Think of that. The angel of the Lord. That's a specific title. This was God's messenger. This was the one that makes all the big announcements. He names himself. We know this angel's name. He's one of the three great archangels. Now there's only two. <laughs> one fell. His name was Lucifer. Then there's you got the other one who's the commander of God's army. His name is what? Michael. And then we have the one that told Mary she was going to be the God bearer. He's the one that announced to Joseph in a dream to go ahead and not be ashamed of Mary, that she's not promiscuous, that she's honorable, and that thing which was inside of her was put there by the Holy Ghost. And that angel's name was what? Gabriel. And Gabriel, of all the people he could have revealed himself to to make this wonderful announcement, he chooses shepherds in the field. The lowest of the low, humble beginnings. Who in the world is going to believe whatever they say? And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, same thing he started out with with Mary. Fear not. Fear not. Listen, when God's in control, when God's working, there's not a thing for you and I to be afraid of. We see the headlines today and they make us quake in our boots. Well, I read a headline today that said in 2024, our wonderful governor is going to outlaw individual propane gas tanks. She's going to outlaw charcoal grills. What in the world is our government doing telling us what to do with our grills? <laughs> right? What right do they have? That was an outlaw. I hope it doesn't pass. But you know, they're getting just a little bit too intrusive, are they not? Boy, Mary and Joseph thought the Romans were bad. They ain't got a handle on the state of New York. And he said, Lord, fear not. You don't have to be afraid. The government can be as dictatorial. It can be worse than Kim Jong-il in North Korea. Be under that horrible persecution. But you know, when Jesus is control, we need to fear not, do we not? For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Good news. That this, what I'm preaching tonight is good news. We should be jumping up down in our pews saying, yeah, yeah, man, that's good news. That is good news. God became a man. And that man is telling us exactly what we need to do to be right with God, to have our sins atoned for, to spend eternity with him in heaven, and to overcome death and sin and have God with us through everything. And what he asks us to do is not that hard. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. What is he saying? Trust me. All you got to do is depend on me. All you got to do is rely on me. Once I've done my work in your life, you're going to be so busy doing the want to's, you won't have time to fret about the shouldn't do's, <laughs> don't do's. We'll be so excited about living for Jesus. It's not about keeping law. I talked about that last Friday night. It's about being grateful for who Jesus is and why he saved you. For unto you is born this day, that first Christmas, in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior. Oh, we have a Savior, which is Christ. And that word Christ in the Greek is Christos. In the Hebrew, it's Messiah. Christ the Lord word Lord, another great word for it is boss. Jesus is the boss, man. <laughs> he is the boss. Is he the boss of your life? And he shall be a sign unto you, and ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace, goodwill toward men. The heavenly host, the army of God, tens and twenties of thousands of angels appeared. 
the barrier between the physical and the spiritual realm at that moment in that place was ripped away. And I believe that the spiritual part of life in the universe is right here. It's parallel with us. But there's something that we can't see. You say, well, that's the most nonsensical thing I ever heard. Oh, yeah, I ever heard of dark matter? You know another proper name for dark matter? It's invisible matter. <laughs> it's not really dark as in black. It's invisible. And it makes up most of our universe. And I think some of these days, God's going to kind of, kind of move that veil. He says the heavens are just going to open up in that unseen world. Paul says that the things that are not seen is what's really in control of the things that are seen. And we're going to see it. And in that night, they saw it. It, it kind of got clear. They, they were able to plainly see and hear the heavenly host. And what were they praising? What were they talking about? What were they praising God for? What were they allowed to see? They were allowed to see Jesus. They were allowed to sing about him and let him know it was an important and great thing to them. And if it was an important and great thing to them, how an important and great thing is it to you and I tonight? Amen. 2023. Doesn't matter if it's 5023 or 8023. The Lord can wait as long as he wants. That doesn't change this fact that God incarnated and became a man. And what is he waiting on? Why has the Lord taken so long? Why did he wait until June 14, 1973? 1973 at about 6 p.m. Why did he wait that long? Who is he waiting on? Me. He was waiting on me. That's the time I got saved. How come is he? Maybe he's waiting on you. How do you and I know? That the next person we win to Christ is the last person that he called and elected to become a Christian. And as soon as that person surrenders to Christ, the trumpets will sound. We just don't know. We just don't know. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. And the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste. You know, it hurts me when I have to beg people to come to Christ. It hurts me when I have to beg them to come to, to church. It hurts. It seems to me that if you understood and really believed the truth of these verses, that you would make haste. You couldn't wait. Why should I bother to beg people to come to Christ when there are people in this world who hadn't even heard of them once? Hadn't even heard the gospel once. Why should I beg them over and over again? We need to get excited about what God has done in history. He's a part of it. And then we have Mary. She kept all these things and pondered him in her heart. You know, there have been times in my life where I've experienced things, and they were important to me times in my life where I've seen God work. Once I laid my hand on a young man in a coma and I prayed for him. And when I said amen, he opened his eyes. Kept that in my heart. There was a time I was ministering to a dying man. And he told me he saw an angel sitting on my shoulder. And I said, what's the name of the angel? And he said, Evelyn. That was my mother's mother's name. Not Evelyn. That's how most people, Evelyn. There's no way he could have known that. Kept that in my heart. 
There were the two times when I saw my infant son and my infant daughter laying in their newborn. Kept that in my heart. There was the day that the judge said that Tom is my son. I remember that day. I remember the day when I gave an invitation at a gospel service in Bagram and a soldier that I had been praying for, he had a reputation of being one of the most hardest soldiers on the camp and he came down and he dropped to his knees and gave life and gave his Savior. Oh, I could tell you story after story after story like that. And I ponder them in my heart. Listen, when you look back into your life, can you see the times when God was working in your life? Can you see the times? Can you remember the time when God was close to you? You knew He was close to you. He was watching out over you. And He was blessing your life. Ponder that this Christmas and thank God for Him. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told for them. How many things have you seen God do in your life? How many things have you seen and heard God do in the lives of others? This is the time of year that we remember those things and ponder them into our hearts. Jesus is the light of the world. And a light has shone in the darkness. And what a great light that was. Amen. Yes. And I don't care what you're going through. You might have had a big family fight on your way here. You might have, you might have had problems. You might have problems in your finances. You might have problems in your relationships. You might have suffering from depression. You may be aching and sore and in pain in your body. You may be fearful of where your next rent payment or where your next finances are going to come from. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Jesus Christ is still incarnate, God incarnate. Amen? Amen. He's Amen. still the one. And you, no matter what your circumstances, if your Christmas is about Jesus, you can't lose. Amen. You can't lose. You can't suffer. You're not going to miss Christmas without Him knowing it and being right there with you. So at this time, we're going to close our service. We're going to stand and sing. And we're going to use a light metaphor tonight. And the light metaphor is we're going to share the light. This candle in the Advent wreath is called the Christ candle. It represents the light of Christ in the world. And we're going to share that light with one another tonight. And even though we're going to blow our candles out, the light inside of us we're going to take with us. Amen? Amen. Amen.